Hey guys, Patrick Lesky. I've been getting a lot of questions about the brewery build and setup. So instead of putting a parts list together, I decided to do a little video on the build and the space. Uh, now we're not brewing today. I promise in the future when we get a brew day together, I'll do a step-by-step -step tutorial on the flow of that. Um, but the biggest thing with this build was probably the space in the home. Uh, we added an addition on the house. You guys can see I have it off just off my kitchen dining room. We got the brewery. The bar. I got a closet behind there that's housing a freezer for the um, glycol control on the on the fermenters, as well as the taps. And then around the corner, got the brew dog there, and uh, good space for football. So uh, we'll start off with the brewery itself. Uh, I did a three-tier system originally just for floor space. This obviously wasn't here originally, and I was limited on where I could have this set up. So. No real reason for it now other, other than I already had it built and I wasn't about to drill any more holes in these pots. So we'll start off with the brew system itself. Uh, top tier would be the hot liquor tank. Uh, bottom right would be the mash tun. And then bottom left is our boil kettle. It's an electric uh, perm setup. I've been seeing quite a bit on the internet lately. Uh, bottom would be the control panel. I'll post pictures of the inside of this later. Um, I built this with the help of my dad. Uh, pretty standard. You got your hot liquor tank control, your mash controller, your boil kettle controller. I got a timer right now that has the capability of uh, doing some automation. Although right now we're just literally using it for a boil timer and hop additions. Um, below this I have alarms set up. so. I usually set this to about 156 on the mash and as it's preheating I turn the alarm on I have it set to go off at 154 just to grab my attention um, so when it, we do get to 156 we we're ready to mash in um, same as boil kettle I have it set a few degrees before the boil would actually start and then I that controller I switch into a manual mode and instead of controlling temp I control the uh, percentage that the coil fires uh, to hold the boil we usually set it about 85 percent that'd be dependent on your system uh, bottom two switches we have pumps again they're set up to have automation right now we just use them in the hand or the manual mode and then uh, the controller right here for the PID control um, obviously selecting which controller has control of the system at any time it's hot liquor tank mash boil and then uh, this switch is whether or not the controllers actually have the ability to fire the coils so we can set this up do tests, um, run the controller, and as long as this switches off, the coils won't fire. I also have a um, an on-off uh, switch down here, uh, and then I have an emergency stop. Um, this is the dead man switch, so uh, we have three little kids running around here. If they were to open the panel, nothing inside the panel will be powered anymore. All right, let's look at the hot liquor tank on top here. Uh, in, inside guts of the hot liquor tank, I have 50 foot stainless steel coil. Uh, came from stainless hardware. And then you can see kind of in the back there, I'm using boil coils on this entire setup. Um, so this would be the, this would be still 220 coil for a 10 gallon pot. Uh, I think that pulls around uh, 300, just over 3000 watts. Um, and then the coil exiting over here. On the outside of the tank, I have the outlet for the water in the hot liquor tank, and then I have the inlet or the return. Uh, if you're not using a Herm system, or those that are, no, you really need to keep a, a whirlpool going in the hot liquor tank during the entire mash process. Otherwise, you get stagnation around the coil and the controllers have a real hard time holding temperature. So that's what that's doing. Just got a 90 degree bend in here. Just spinning the hot liquor tank as we're uh, mashing in. Now, uh, the temperature sensor for the hot liquor tank is on the return to the tank. Um, you get the most, the quickest response time on the controllers if they can sense that change right as it goes back into the tank. You're gonna find that to be the same setup on my mash tank, when we, mash tun when we take a look at it. On the, this side, I have my, Herms coil, so I have 
my inlet to the Herms coil goes in the coil and then my exit output on the Herms coil and then I have it set up. I have a little sight glass from SS Brutex. We can see the process and it's really for me to see that I have good flow and I don't have any, I've had a couple times where we've had a stuck mash so I can see that right there without opening the lid. Um, on the back side here, I have the temperature controller for the mash ton, which I was talking about. I really get a good uh, accurate control with that temperature sensor being on the, uh, on the input to the mash tank. And then I have a three piece or a three way valve down here. This is so I can go either into the mash ton or I can go to the sparge arm. Uh, it's an L style uh, three way valve using silicone holes on the bottom here for the, for the actual sparge arm. Now you guys will see the spools for the tri-clamp fittings. Honestly, this is just because I'm prissy, there's no real functionality. I eventually plan to hard pipe this all the way down to the pumps at the bottom, which we'll get into. Uh, but really for now, it's so that when it's, everything's put away and we're not brewing, and I'm sitting at my kitchen table that I don't see a bunch of hoses running everywhere. Um, on to the mash ton. Uh, pretty straightforward. I'm using Megapots. Um, really would like to switch to SS Brutex kettles, but uh, they weren't around at the time when we were building this. So this is what we got. Uh, mash ton. I talked about the setup back here. Um, so you can see off of that three-way valve here is the inlet. Uh, for the mash ton, I'm using a I'm using the manifold from SS Brutech. Really like it, big fan. Uh, hooked up to again silicone holes, high temp tubing, and then I have a quick disconnect on it. I it's really just because I've had quick disconnects in spades here laying around the house. You wouldn't necessarily need this, but um, it's nice to be able to disassemble real easy and put it back together. So when we're mashing in again. I have the manifold in here. This is connected. It's a quick disconnect sitting on top of the green bed. Have my false bottom a little askew here, but you can see there, I really like these uh, uh, flush bulkhead fittings. Uh, I got them from Northern Brewer, um, so you don't have any threads exposed the inside of the kettle. It's real slick, real clean. Um, I have Blickman uh, temperature controllers. We were using this system before the automation came along for the control panel. Obviously, no real need for those. I do find the one on the hot liquor tank useful. Um, for when I'm when we get into brew day later, uh, when I'm sparging and the temperature controller is focusing on uh, the sparge, I can still see what the temperature of the liquor is in the uh, or excuse me the water is in the hot liquor tank. Now back to this setup here again. I got the mash ton uh, input recirculating through the Herms coil um, within the hot liquor tank, which is holding temperature during the mash. Um, so we're doing that you know anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes generally. And then when time comes to uh, sparge, I'm using the SS, SS Brutech sparge arm. Big fan, you guys will find I'm a fan of SS Brutech in general. Um, I do think that their mount is junk for this and also it's not designed for Megapod, although it work. Um, their original mounting system comes with a rubber, uh, basically a rubber clamp that sits on your handle of your mash ton. Uh, what I did was just got an aluminum lug uh, for an for for electrical panel from Home Depot. They make them in all different diameters, so you just take your sparge arm in. I honestly don't remember what size it was, but I get a real nice tight fit. I can loosen it up back here, although I've, I've, I have it set pretty well where I can move it up and down and it holds position. Um, and then all I did was I used a stainless steel bolt to come through, um, some food grade silicone, although I, I generally do 10 gallon batches, um, so I'm generally not up in this range, but it is watertight. And then all I did uh, was bend the bolt um, so that I have somewhere to hang this uh, manifold on when we're mashing in. So when I'm stirring the grains, I can get this manifold up and out of the way. I still have the water recirculating through it, but at least it doesn't get in my way with the mash paddle. Uh, so that's what I have going on back here. Again, the three-way valve to control that. Right now it would, it would send it into the mash tun via the manifold if I turn it down then that's going to send me to the sparge arm during the sparge. For those of you guys that aren't using Herm's setup, a huge fan of how it's designed. When I'm mashing, uh, when we're doing the mash, we're constant recirculation up here. Again, that Whirlpool gives the controllers the ability to hold a real nice temperature in the hot liquor tank. And then also obviously recirculating the mash ton. Um, we'll get into the pump system here in a little bit. So mash ton, when we go to transfer to the boil kettle, 
A um, little complicated down here, guys. Uh, probably end up reworking this pump system a little bit. But I basically have two pumps. Um, I have water pump up top here, and then I have the bottom pump, which is the only pump that comes in contact with the wart. Um, again, with the Herm setup, it's real slick. While I'm mashing in, I have obviously hot wart going up through this pump, getting pumped back up into the uh, Herms coil. But then when we go to sparge, I start pulling water from the hot liquor tank, going into this top pump, and then this mess of pipe you see back here allows me to either direct the wart up through the Herms coil, or depending on valve placement, I can send the hot water from the hot liquor tank up through the sparge arm. So it's real nice when you're done mashing out and then you've sparged for you know half an hour to an hour, uh, as you're collecting your wort into the boil kettle, you're also cleaning the Herms coil, so you end up uh, having minimal cleanup towards the end of the brew day. I still do run PBW through it, um, and then we passivate it a couple times a year, but um, in general, it's real slick how this works out. So for the, for the uh, piping down here, I have my output of my mash tun. I, uh, again, guys, I'll, I'll do another review when we do a brew day, but I pipe comes, uh, hose comes down here, connects to the three-way here for the pump for the wart. Um, we'll get into selection here in a little bit, but basically when I'm mashing, it's coming in here, it's going through the pump. All these two valves you'll see here, and then up here as well are my bleeders for my pumps so we can get the air out so, the, so I never have an issue with cavitation. And then they're actually pumped over here. Um, you'll see why I have those hoses running, a, a, they're, they're obviously quite long. Um, but this is a big drain manifold that I built. Um, goes goes back. I have two ports here. I have a front port that I use for the fermenters to dump dump into the floor drain here. Um, comes around back. I have another T that I use for my uh, uh, output on my cold water when we're doing the chiller plate. And then this goes down back behind the brew rig. And then I um, have a, actually have a floor drain set up um, with a tri clamp on it underneath the brew rig, um, which I can tell you guys was pretty f pretty fun to try to get the uh, city inspector to sign off on a floor drain on a wood floor, but uh, we got her done. So with, again, with mashing, we're gonna come in here, out the pump. Again, this bleeder's gonna be closed. And then I have a three-way in the back. And all that's allowing me to do um, for mashing, we're gonna send it back up. And then again, up to the Herms coil, which goes all the way up back and comes up to that spool uh, way in the top there of the hot liquor tank. Um, once we get done mashing and we're sparging, this is obviously my sparge water and my pump. This valve will get opened. Um, I close the return on the hot liquor tank, forcing um, the water to go through the Herms coil instead of back into the hot liquor tank. And then back here again, these are all L style three-way valves uh, in the back here. I turn the valve and now I can send it to this nozzle here which during brew day, we have my plate chiller down on the floor. And again, there's no reason why I couldn't leave it down here other than I'm prissy and I like how it looks hanging up on my brew stand. That connects there with a quick disconnect. And, uh, and then so we can come through into the plate chiller and guys, now this looks a little fancy. I'm gonna pull it out so you can see it a little better. Um, but all I did here, we do a ton of IPAs, New England IPAs. Um, I found it very helpful to to be able to bypass the plate chiller while you're roll pulling so we don't clog it up. Um, now if you're, you know, I'm brewing on a wood floor, so my setup, I, I don't change hoses around during brew day. Everything start to finish is all internally connected so that I have no way of dumping any type of liquid onto the floor. Um, so anyways, during during transfer of from the mash tun to the boil kettle, I'm gonna have uh, this in bypass. I've color coded them so I, regardless of how many drinks we have during brew day, I don't mess this up. So we come, we're bypassing the plate chiller, it's coming out. I threw a, a T here on the, on the output of the plate chiller and a thermometer so we can use for uh, transfer to the fermenter uh, later in the process. I have a sight glass, there's a, I don't know, I, I use it a little bit to make sure the pump's pumping into the, hot, into the uh, boil kettle, but you really, again, if you just open the lid on the boil kettle, you'd obviously see that too. It's really just that I have an addiction to stainless steel. Now, we're transferring into the uh, boil kettle. We're gonna come out here on the chiller plate, 
come up the hose with the hose to the top valve here on the boil kettle um, as we mash in get rid of the pot here then here's the internal uh, components of the boil kettle uh, again a big fan of the Blickman um, heating coil no reason you couldn't do something else but uh, it's what I decided to go with again I have the um, the threadless uh, bulkhead fittings really like them to get a clean tight seal on the kettle uh, I have obviously the top one again is for Whirlpool and that's where I'm going to be returning that wart uh, from the mash tun into the boil kettle uh, as we're collecting that temperature probe on the boil kettle for the controller and uh, again Blickman thermometer on the front again we were using this with the um, if you guys haven't noticed I have an edimental stand here it throws a lot of guys off I have the guts removed on the stand itself I just I had it from when we were brewing outside so I used it um, but again this pot we were using on the on the edimental at the time so that's why it has the thermometer in the front no real need looks cool though um, I have the heating coil uh, again this is the bigger one this is be a 220 uh, I think it's 5500 watts uh, if the boil works real slick I I honestly when I'm about a gallon or two away from collecting my uh, wart volume I kick the controller on and by the time I'm done mashing out she's about ready to boil so that's my uh, setup with the boil kettle now again this is my real reason I want to do another tutorial during a brew day but as we're gonna uh, collect our wart from the boil kettle I got my lower valve there it's got a 90 and honestly during brew day I found what works out real slick is uh, that I have this this um, Blickman sells these it comes with the coil to hold it up off the bottom of your kettle I actually I must have moved it while I cleaned but um, I put that right in front of that 90 degree bend it acts like a trub dam it works out real slick I generally have zero issues with um, clogging the plate chiller or just uh, clarity of the wort going into the fermenter now as it's coming down out of the boil kettle I'm again I'm going into the pump down here the bottom coming back up to the nozzle and then into this plate chiller and then then would rotate the three-way valve it's going to send it through the plate chiller um, I'll show you where my cold water source is in here a little bit and then I come out of the plate chiller itself and then what I've decided to do I put a I put a three-way or a T again because I don't want to undo any of this plumbing while I'm brewing I have the T that goes on to the end of that plate chiller you just saw and then I bought off of Brewer's Hardware a sample valve. It's a pretty good size. I have a half inch barbed hose. Um, this works real slick for holding constant temperature out of the plate chiller. I generally can pull about a gallon to two gallons a minute uh, through the plate chiller holding about 68, 70 degrees. And then again with the sampling valve it gives me a real fine control of the output to the fermenter. Um, the rest of the hose I just got a, I got a tri-clamp fitting. And during brew day that would be hooked. I have a T. I have uh, SS Brutex oxygenation system right here. Um, and then whatever fermenter we're going to go into. I'm running a 14 gallon unit tank and then a um, just a standard conical from SS Brutex, although it looks like a brewmaster. I cheaped out initially, um, which was a big 